I would like to get started by introducing our guest speakers for this evening, Professor Carter Keough, Professor Hunter Mack, and Professor Kalila Wolkowitz, all from the Francis College of Engineering, and then Tom O'Donnell, who is the Senior Director of the Innovation Initiatives and also teaches in the Manning School of Business. So with that, I would like to welcome our guest speakers. I would like to welcome everyone um, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and Tom, I will pass it off to you. All right, thank you, Holly. Um, I can share you, yes? Yes. Yep, here we go, okay. Uh, hang on. Can you see that? Can you see that, Holly? All right, very good. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna cover this evening the broader topic of business models and how that ties into the overall strategy of how you're gonna take your ideas, move them forward and be able to position your nascent ventures for convincing key stakeholders that what you're doing is compelling. That's important. And the business model plays a big part in that. So, oops, sorry. Quick definition, and you guys can read this. But the essence of that business model is how all the pieces come together to position your venture, your entity to be successful in creating a product and delivering that product to your customer in a way that's financially sustainable, generating revenues that cover the costs so that there's hopefully some surplus, sure. surplus so you can reinvest and grow and scale your venture. Let's look at a few. FedEx. FedEx didn't create package delivery. They created at the time where the postal service was the primary vehicle for delivering letters and packages. They created overnight delivery for a segment of organizations that found that to be valuable and were willing to pay a premium. Zipcar, create, you know, Zipcar, uh, access to vehicles at that, you know, shared vehicles. At the time, the uh, model in place was rent a vehicle from Hertz, from Avis, from others over a, a single day, multiple days. But they came in and said, there's a market for access to vehicles in smaller time frames, hours, multiple hours. And they were able to do that because there were technologies that allowed their customers to engage them in an automated fashion that made, made that less than one day rental, compelling and easy to engage and profitable for Zipcar. Pillpack, pharmacies were there to give you your medications, but some, some of the customers not only had multiple medications that they were juggling, but it was difficult for them to get to the pharmacy. Pillpack came in, delivered their, their service online, and their customers got a delivery of medications that were packaged in a way that took all their medications together and make, made it easy for them to just have a package. And at the time during the day that they needed to take their medications, there was a package, they opened it up and it said for multiple medications, take it at that time during the day. And that was something that made it easy and compelling for those patients overall. Gillette, their 
business model was to basically uh, couple not only the technology, but the mechanism of how that gets delivered to the customer. It's compelling because it's not just the razor, it's also the razor blades. And most of the value in many ways was the, the razor, but for, uh, for Gillette, it was more focused on the, uh, the razor blades overall. And so they kind of shifted in a way that it wasn't one thing, but it was two pieces, the razor and then the razor blade. And it worked out that they, Gillette, received more value from the razor blade. And that was pretty compelling overall. And then Facebook. Let's go back to that. Facebook, um, the value was compelling to their customers who were using Facebook, but there was value in what they were doing to others in the marketplace. And ultimately, their customer in, in many ways wasn't the customer that most folks uh, thought about and engaged with. And so in, in this, Facebook presented a solution to their customer overall, the, the user, but the real paying customer for Facebook was the advertisers. And that's why all of us who use Facebook don't really pay for it, right? And that's pretty compelling. So being aware of that and know how to navigate that. So it's, so it's uh, all those pieces come together. And ultimately all these pieces come together so that it gets you from that idea phase through all these stages to that eventual impact and understanding how, where the risks are in your business model around not only just the technology, but the market issues around putting that forward. And the uh, legal and regulatory pieces that you needed to be aware of so that you didn't get in trouble when you, uh, if for instance, the, uh, the regulatory environment shifted or there were issues around the, the, um, the uh, uh, technology, how it uh, follows through, for instance, the, um, the uh, regulatory issues around uh, how you patent and push that forward. But also, for instance, if there's new regula regulations that come into the market overall. So as the entrepreneur, understanding all those risks and pushing forward in these three areas around not just your technology, but the markets and your team overall. There's risks in all of this and how it comes together. And your business model helps you navigate how you put these pieces together. So ultimately, it's your business model talks about what you're delivering, the product and the technology, but also why you're delivering it because of the, there's a need in the market and then how you're delivering it 
in terms of your team and the partners you're going to be working with and how all these pieces come together. And ultimately, is your team positioned well in them from a technology standpoint and can deliver that technology either individually or with partners? Do you understand the market and where that gap is in the market and who else is playing in the market, the competition? And so that there's that market team fit overall. And the most important on all of this is how what you're suggesting from a solution, right? How that product you're delivering fits in the market so that product market fit makes sense. And that's the foundation of your value proposition. And that value proposition, which you talked about in the last session, is at the core of your strategy of all these pieces around the, uh, the, um, the business model. If that value prop and that product market fit is not there, all the other pieces don't make any sense because you're gonna be pushing something uphill that doesn't make any sense in the market overall. So let's look at this more fully. So you as a venture and framing it like this uh, makes that business model uh, more compelling. So this entity that you envision, whether a for-profit or a non-profit is in the business of bringing that value that we just talked about to the customer. And it could be multiple customers. And if you do that correctly, right, they're willing to pay you. And that's a good thing. And the, the reason they're looking to pay you because what you put on the table is compelling to them. Either it's bringing value, it's a, a painkiller, a vitamin, it's doing things in a way that's better, faster, cheaper, more compelling than what's out there already. And you as a venture need to be able to tell that story in a pretty, pretty compelling way. And if you do it the right way, they're gonna pay you. Amen, that's a beautiful thing. But hopefully they pay you enough that it covers the costs of what you're doing. And there's a lot of stuff you're gonna be doing. And not only what you're doing, but there's enough there so that it can compensate your partners so that the ultimate profit makes it uh, strategic and compelling for you. That's where the profit comes in, comes in. And this makes sense, not only if you're a for-profit entity, but also if you're a nonprofit. Because if you're in a nonprofit, and as Holly and others, others would tell you, many of the ventures that go through Difference maker are nonprofits. That's okay. But if you want to be sustainable overall, you need to think around how those revenues come in to you so that you can continue to pay your people, buy the things you need to buy, pay for the rent on the place where you're hanging out and, and so many different things. And we can talk about that more in, in, in other ways. 
So please, please, please frame it like this, even if you're a nonprofit. So a little deeper. So we just talked about that. And the hope is that that value that you think you're delivering is compelling, is differentiated. And it's either via that, that product or a service, but more compelling, it's both. Both a product and a service that you deliver together that makes it um, more attractive for your customer. But, Tom, Tom, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, and, and it may be a good time to to jump out and have Please. Uh, the students that are here questions. But I, I had one because you know, I was thinking about it a second ago. So we jumped right into talking about what a business model is and why we need to develop it. It also might be useful to to understand from your experience where people like you know, do you have any case studies or like experiences with people who don't have a very good business model or don't develop one and go into something and where the pitfalls might be? Because, you know, for it's probably the first time a lot of these students are putting together like a formal business model. Um, so it, here's, it might it might be nice to know some cautionary tales. So let me, Hunter, thank you uh, for bringing that up. Let me phrase it this way. Don't get super caught up on the broader concept of a business model today, except to understand that this framework that we're gonna to suggest to you is one that can help you start thinking about all the pieces that come together, are gonna to need to come together for you to create and drive a sustainable venture, a sustainable business at the stage we're at Right now, the most important piece of this, which is at the core of the business model, is that product market fit. That what you have is it compelling and useful for a segment in the market that you're thinking about overall. And to answer your question, that by far is the number one reason why ventures fail, because they built something that nobody cares about. They built something that they love and they talk to a couple of their friends, but that's it, right? Well and, and, and I think that's the key point to nail home is that, you know, you can have an interesting idea, right? It can be a good idea. It can be a bad idea. And, and that's fine. And especially when we're talking about college competitions and prototyping competitions, that can be a nice idea. What the business model does and what Tom's trying to bring home here is that you have to think about a lot of external factors outside of that. Like, how are you going to make the thing, right? How are you going to get it to the customers? How are they going to pay for it? What kind of model is it? Is it a subscription model? Is it a one-time use? Is it a point of sale? Do you sell through the internet? These are all questions that, you know, I'm an engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. I don't think about these things. I think about the technology, right? But you have to think about it in a, uh, not a holistic way, but you kind of have to have, look at it from 360 degrees in order for the business to be successful, right? But on the other hand, you know, being able to think about what the market is you know, you can avoid those pitfalls of building something that you think is cool that nobody wants. I, I, I always think back to the uh, the Segway, the personal uh, mobility Segway, which, it, you know, when it was announced, it was going to revolutionize uh, the way we, we get around in this world. And now all you see is like tourist groups riding around on them, right? They didn't do their market research whatsoever. It was pretty sad. Um, but um, Tom, I just I just wanted to interject oh, that. No, that's, it's, that's nice to, it's nice to, to frame it like, OK. You know, let's have a we have a good idea, but man, there's all this other stuff that can go into that. And it's actually not that complicated. It just takes some concerted thought. Absolutely. And ultimately, there are more different types of business models than you can shake a stick at. So again, figuring out the one 
that makes the most sense. And there are categories of business models and we're, we don't have time to go through all of them. What we're trying to frame today are the elements of the business model that you can think about. And then ultimately through the Difference Maker program and through the mentoring and coaching, we can help you figure out which one of those flavors potentially makes the most sense. So the one around the, uh, the razor blade, Gillette, right? They, as opposed to selling the razor and the razor blade together to their customer, their business model said, well, that's gonna be expensive. Let's sell them just the handle for the, for the razor at a cost that's much less than what actually costs overall. And then let's lock them in to the recurring costs of the razor blades. Buy the razor once, and then buy the razor blades many, many times down the road. That business model of razor, razor blade is compelling. So as you think about your solutions, can you break it apart so that there's a platform piece and then some consumables on the back end that your customer will pay many, many times down the road? And Gillette made most of their money on that back end. That's an example of a business model, pulling these pieces together. So thinking this through, company selling something to the customer, part of the business model says, how do I deliver that to the customer? Do I put it on the shelves at Walmart or do I deliver it through the internet, through Amazon, something else? Who is gonna help me build it? Those suppliers that I need to work with, materials and consulting support and potentially even financing to help me do that overall. And there's so many flavors around this. And ultimately pulling this together so that you position it so it's better than your competitors. Because don't kid yourselves, your competitors are talking not only to your customers, but also to your channel partners and to your suppliers and to your investors, but also to your employees, right? And trying to attract your employees to them to help them do their things. So your business model and your strategy is not only how you deliver, how you build it and deliver it, but it's also how you maintain a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis the other players in the market. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, where does trade secrets fall into place in the, in the, in the business model? Like I'm sorry, say, say that again, please. Like where does trade secret, a trade secret, where does it fall in the business model or does it not fall in it at all? Or no, it does. So hold that thought if you would, and I'll answer that in a second. So real quickly, in the broader framework, as you're doing this, just be aware that there's some macro level issues that if you're not aware of around the economic conditions, social dynamics, environmental issues, legal and regulatory issues, polit political issues. If you don't follow all those, it's gonna make it much harder for you to deliver your product, your solution into the market. And let me give you an example. Back in 2007, 2009, if you were looking to deliver a product in the markets at that time, when 
the entire uh, economy went south. It would be extremely difficult for you to deliver that at that point in time, right? From a regulatory standpoint, what if you were delivering something that required a reg regulation or some support that the government was providing to the customers that compelled them to buy your product? And all that shifts. So let's just say um, the um, uh, the uh, essentially the kickbacks and the uh, the money that the government was giving to early users to to adopt and use some of these technologies early on that that got pulled away. That would change the dynamics in the market. So be aware of that. Also, just from how you're positioning your stuff in this, what we're calling the value chain and how you deliver your product to the customer and then how the money comes back to you and to your suppliers in a little bit more detail. This is one I like to use. It's a value chain that's more fleshed out from raw materials, um, components, subsystems, systems, and then getting that out to the, the channel, the suppliers, and ultimately to the end user. Why do we put this up here? Because in many cases, you're not doing all of this. You're not making the material. You're not creating potentially some of those subcomponents. You're not even delivering that to the system vendors, right? So you need to understand where you play in this dynamic. And just to suggest one market overall, right? You need to at least at the highest level. And when I say the highest level, it could be that, let's just look at this again. It could be just this, right? Who do you need to supply you stuff? And then who do you need to work with to bring that product to the market to satisfy that customer need, okay? Understand it at that level, but eventually get to this, right? Because a key decision is where do I play in this? And so most companies play in one piece of that, right? They potentially deliver a system or a subsystem. And we can help you with this. Tesla, as a company, plays in multiple. Yes, they started as an electric vehicle, right? But eventually figured out that they needed to not only do that, but also build the underlying battery systems. Right, the back end, but then figured out they also need to be that entity facing the customer and created a direct to customer uh, vehicle and some showrooms to actually make that happen. So now Tesla is covering a lot more, not suggesting you do that because it takes a lot more effort overall and investment, but sometimes uh, you may need to do it. But then in the back end, I'm sorry, back in the day, Ford vehicle manufacturer did everything from the, the 
uh, forests that they harvested the rubber and the wood, the beaches where they harvested the sand and all the uh, pieces in between that they're actually created, the materials, the subsystems, the systems that eventually went in to the vehicles to make that happen. You're not that, don't even think that, right? So ultimately, this business model talks about that model in who you're working with, how what you're doing is different, how you price in those cost structures and how you're delivering, um, how you're generating revenue overall, who you're working with on the back end, those strategic partners who you need to work with to help that to ha happen. And then in this industry overall, where are you playing? Where do you sit in that? You're not gonna have all the answers today, but at some point, understanding the questions you're gonna need to ask overall to help you do that. And ultimately, how you're gonna capture that optimal value for you in that value chain. And so the canvas is a tool to help you do that, okay? And so if you look at this, you as a company, it's those resources you have, the equipment, the knowledge, the capabilities. And back to the question that was asked, the secret sauce that you have around that, right? Which is the trade secrets. That's part of that. That ties in to the resources as a company. And then how you leverage that. That's you as a company. And then focus on who those customers are, that market segment overall, and understand there can be many, right? And then delivering that, that value. And here on the, the canvas, I have intentionally put these here because the canvas pieces align with this overall and the channel partners that you're working with and the suppliers that you uh, need to engage with and make sure that you're keeping that value in place overall. And so this is just a framework to help you navigate the storytelling that you're gonna to need to do to engage not only your customers, but as I said, your investors, your partners, your, your, your early employees and others to help you do this. So very, very quickly, because the exercise we're gonna ask you, it just at this stage, Try to think through some of these pieces that you're gonna to need to answer to get you pulling together a, that business model for your venture. Any questions before I jump in? Okay. Customer segments, extremely, important. Biggest thing to walk away with is it's not one size fits all for you. When you start, you can say, I want to be everything to everybody. That doesn't work in the real world. So your challenge is to segment your, that broader space and figure out what are those segments that I need to identify 
identified. And for each one, excuse me, what value do I uniquely deliver for that segment? And if you haven't figured it out, yes, it's okay to have multiple value propositions. It's not a one size fits all. But if each of those value props for each of those segments don't have at least 70 to 80% of similarity, I think you need to, to scratch your head, right? Because that core value needs to be similar in all those segments or else you're gonna be chasing a lot of different things and that's not gonna scale. Does that make sense? We talked to this already. Unique value props for each segment and my most important advice on this, two most important pieces, try to come up with a vitamin, with a painkiller, something that's acute, that they need, they need you, as opposed to something that, yeah, hey, that's pretty cool. I like it, and I might like to have it, but it's not something that they need to buy, a vitamin, right? And the second piece is do not talk about features and functions in your value prop. Yes, features and functions are important, but there's that translation piece on features and functions, how those features and functions deliver value, deliver benefits to the customer. So talk about benefits, the language of benefits, not features and functions. The channels, how you're getting your stuff to the market. What the expectation is your team cannot be that customer facing entity for everything. Maybe you can if your product is only for five customers, 10 customers, right? That's probably not the case overall. So that delivery of that value to that customer and then supporting it on the back end, you're not gonna do it at all. And so identifying, and here's the most important piece, understanding who those players are in the market who are already delivering the value that you're talking about and how you can work with them to, to, to deliver that value. And the biggest example, it's uh, if you're coming up with a medical device or something that plays in the medical space, if you do not understand how the, the, the hospitals and the doctors buy today and who they buy from, you're gonna fail. So think about companies like McKesson and others in that space, understand that. So that's an example in the medical space, right? Understand it in your space. And then figure out how to tie into that because you're gonna to need to not only convince your customers, but convince those channel partners why they wanna work with you. Similar story, but part of that value prop. No matter if you're delivering it directly to your customers or working with a channel partner, you still own that customer relationship. You own that getting the customer to develop that 
preference for your stuff, right? And you can work uh, with your channel partners to do that, but it's on you as a company to do that. So this is all about the marketing, the outreach, the positioning in this space so that you ultimately get your customers to not only do the first purchase, but that experience is compelling. So they stay with you, you get them, and then you keep them, but also you grow them. You get them to buy more. You bring in more solutions, potentially not only yours, but stuff that your partners are, have overall. Tom, I have another question. Go ahead. So right in the beginning, when you started explaining the different parts of this, this concept called the business model canvas, and you were talking about, you said that people buy or into people buy stuff, not entities. Is that correct? People buy from people. So if I may take it one step further, yeah. do not, do not tell me, do not tell me that your customer is the hospital. Eh, that's the wrong answer. Who at the hospital is the person who's not only going to buy your product, but it's going to influence the buying of that product. And it's going to write the check for that product, right? And as importantly, might actually be the saboteur and might want to sabotage the buying of that product. Well, that's awfully that's, negative. There's saboteurs involved in this. No, think about it. What if your product puts somebody at the hospital out of their job, right? But what if you had a product and I'm working with somebody right now that uh, said, um, we can review x-rays and, and, and other, gra uh, other pictures and come up with a solution that says you're sick, you have cancer, right? Who does that at the hospital today? The radiologists, okay? You potentially are putting them out of work. Yeah, and, and it, it's just interesting because I think the medical, the medical device or the medical field is, is, is kind of the classic example of this where you, you have more than one customer, right? Like you're, you're trying to make the hospital happy and the insurance company happy and the, you know, the doctor's happy, you're gonna be using your instrument and the patient's happy, right? So it's a very, it, it can be a, a complex field. And, but that's often the case for stuff that you don't realize because, you know, you end up sell, selling to not only the person who's going to use it, but selling to distribution channels, and and they are different customers, so to speak, and and it's a good it's a good thing to keep your eye on. And Ben Hunter, to that point, where all of you are at today, in your venture um, path, right? That experience. Don't assume that you're going to have these answers. You're not even going to be close. What we're trying to help you understand is what questions you're gonna to need to ask to help you understand these broader dynamics so that you answer the questions to help you position in the best way to operate within this context of an ecosystem in the industry you're, uh, you're gonna be working in. And this business model is just a way to frame a lot of that. Thank you for that question, Hunter. The revenue streams, not going to belabor this, but how are you going to make money? Sell a product, sell a, a service, get them to, to buy a subscription from you. Uh, many, many ways. And this is where, when we talk about different business models, this is where there's a lot of dif uh, differentiation. So not going to uh, belabor this at this point. Suffice to say, 
um, lots of ways. One thing I do want to mention, if you think that your solution is I'm going to develop my tech and then license it, that's great. I would caution you that this whole exercise of figuring out the venture value is still compelling because here's why. If you understand all these dynamics and you want to license your tech to another company, you are gonna be in a much stronger position to, to no negotiate that contract from that company because you truly understand the value as opposed to saying, hey, what do you think it's worth? And give me a piece of that. Do you think they're gonna have your best interest in mind? Probably not. So this exercise is still valuable, even if you think your business model is to license. Oops. So stay in the game. Key resources, the people, the equipment, right? The intellectual property that you have, the trade secrets, the knowledge, the, the experiences you have, the relationships, all that stuff is extremely important. So continue to build, but as important is how you, <laughs> how you work it, how you put those pieces together, right? How you get your engineering to work with your marketing, to, um, to position the, the uh, all those different pieces. And key, key point here, the absolute most important question that I advise folks on is what pieces do we keep internal to our company or which pieces do we partner away, right? Extremely important question because you can't do it all. You can not do it all. So key strategic question, internal versus external, right? What's core to the business and what's more contextual? What's more something that, yes, still important, but it's one that I wanna work with my partners on, right? Very important. And here, it's just those relationships in that broader context that you need to work with. Suppliers, partners, um, advisors and others that get you to move that forward. Let's not belabor this one. And then <laughs> the revenue streams, right? How those monies come in, fixed variable costs. I'm sorry, I'm, hey, I'm sorry. I'm on costs, not revenue streams. Um, all the stuff that, that you're gonna pay for, it's gonna roll, roll in to your financial modeling. And here's the thing, do you know this? six months, a year, three years down the road? Probably not. But you can start thinking about that model of all the pieces that tie in to that cost structure so that when somebody asks, okay, what are those cost structures? You can talk intelligently about it because they're gonna ask. Oops, one of those pieces. Oh, I think the revenue part came earlier. Yeah, this one on the revenue side, right? Let's not belabor it. As you start pushing forward, 
being able to talk intelligently about where that comes from and how it comes, extremely important. So with all of that, it's, it's how all those pieces come together and how those uh, guesses, those hypotheses that you have right now, because they are, that's okay. The, the, the point where you're at right now, in many ways, it's not the answers that you need to find, but in many cases, it's which questions do I Eve even need to ask, right? That's okay. Put a stake in the ground. This is what you know today. What questions do I need to know beyond that? And many of it is wrong. That's okay. But at some point, excuse me, you're gonna get it right. And getting to that point, there's gonna be many shifts. There's gonna be many pivots based upon what you learn. And that process, that's a, a fun process. It's a learning experience and embrace it. Don't be afraid to fail. But what we always advise, fail fast and fail cheap and fail in a way that you learn, right? That position you for quicker success. And here we are at the exercise. At this point, we're gonna break you out into the rooms. And let's, if you would like to take a stab at all the pieces and jot down where you are in all of these areas, right? Terrific, that's awesome. And we're gonna have, I think what, about 15, 20 minutes? Yes, Holly? Yeah, we can do, I would say about 15 minutes and then everyone can come back and then do their presentations. I did just wanna let everyone know, I emailed you all the PowerPoint business model canvas worksheet around five o'clock this evening. Through the chat, we can only share PDFs, not PowerPoints. But if you download the PowerPoint, you'll be able to actually type right into the business model canvas and then you can share your screen during the presentation part. So you can share that PowerPoint uh, after the activity is done. So um, look for that in your email. So, and, and to build on that, don't go crazy on all the other pieces. If, if you wanna focus a bit, please, 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 because we're gonna beat you up on this piece time and time again, customer segments customer segments and how they tie in to the value that you built out in the last workshop is by far the most important piece. Because if that value prop doesn't tie in to those customer segments, all of their bets are off. So with that, Ollie, the floor is yours. All right, so um, I also wanted to introduce Adam Dunbar. So he is the operations person behind the scenes helping us with Zoom. So Adam is going to launch the breakout rooms. They are the same categories as workshops one and two. So please choose the category or topic that most interests you or where you think your idea best fits in. And then we have the guest speakers here this evening. We have other faculty fellows as well as Difference Maker staff who will be joining the rooms and helping you uh, think about your business model canvas and completing that. So please join those rooms. I'll sit back here in case anyone has any last questions or needs assistance getting into any of those rooms. And then we'll do the presentations at the end of the event. Thank you so much for, uh, for working the exercise. Holly, how do you want to do this? Um, Tom, if you want to just take volunteers, see if anyone wants to share their business model canvases and we can sort of talk through it, give feedback. Absolutely. Uh, who wants to jump in? 
everybody can can unmute, right, Ollie? I could jump in if. Please, thank you. It seems like there's an overwhelming amount of people that want to do this. So, um, Jack, Ryan, and I are sarcastic? from. Were you, were you being sarcastic? A little bit, yeah. Hey, that's good. I can Sorry, be sarcastic. Sorry, I, I hope too. that came across. I'm teasing. <laughs> Ask Holly. I can be pretty damn sarc sarcastic, too. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> so, Jack, Ryan, and I are from Team Annapolis Day. You guys saw us at the last Difference Maker competition, and I know we're seeing a lot of familiar faces now. So, it's great to get to know you guys. So our product is a pill container for kids um, and adolescents at this point. So our resources would kind of come from like um, plastics, manufacturing, that type of area of expertise. We obviously wouldn't be doing the manufacturing ourselves of the product, but we'd be outsourcing that to companies that could handle that, um, whether this is more streamlined 3D printing or hopefully down the road if we get bundles of cash injection molding. Um, so our value propositions, what we bring to value is that we all offer an alternative way to the traditional pill case for younger populations. And we kind of help with the stigma that comes with taking your pills and trying to remember and having like your pill case that you would, it was mostly associated with kind of like older adults, um, and things like that. So like it's harder for kids and younger adults to be able to use one without feeling embarrassed or like kind of feeling like they need to hide it. So there's like the value that comes with that. Um, there's the value with um, being able to travel with our product. I'm trying not to go more into like what you said with the don't talk about features and functions. So it's, it's hard to kind of toe that line. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, I agree with you. And when you catch yourself on that, pull back because, yeah, yeah people people do care about features and benefit, features and function. Mm -hmm. But if you do not intentionally translate that into the benefits, you're relying on them to do the translation, mm -hmm. and they may translate that in a completely different way than you would hope. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess to add in another value is it is creative whimsical. I don't know. See, it's it's hard to tell that line. I, I swear. Um, no, I I think it's great. So, let me, as I was listening to you guys, right? What's the big thing in healthcare these days? There's a lot of things, but there's one big thing. Well, there's a lot of big things. There are a lot of big things. It's hard to pinpoint one. Uh, information, right? Health informatics, all this data that so many people want access to to help optimize and streamline, right? When I was listening to you, I'm thinking, what if, what do you call your product? An apple a day. An apple a day. What if this apple a day had embedded sensors and potentially a connectivity that allowed the usage of that, that Apple a day to tie in to a backend IT infrastructure so that the compliance on the usage piece could be tracked, but then all that data on the backend could be anonymized and there's some value to third parties for those data sets to do things like clinical trials and other stuff. That was a conversation we had in the other breakout, but getting creative around information. Mm -hmm. And I think Kevin could talk to that a bit and others, but just think outside the box, not saying jump into that now, because that's a, a bigger thing, but the, that landscape of of partners and others could be pretty compelling. But I like what you've said already. And focus is absolutely a good thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for listening. You're welcome. Others? Um, Sam Scribby and Alex would like to go next. Guys, jump in. Hi. 
Um, Alex, can you share your screen? Uh, yep. Okay. So, hmm? did someone say something? I said I love it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Alex and I are team Wonderwheel. Our customer segment is basically manual wheelchair users. Or, okay, I, I, I'll let Alex explain the value proposition. Uh, yeah. So, we're looking to make an affordable power assist device that will improve manual wheelchair users' quality of life and offer them access to improved movement capabilities. Can I, can I jump in real quick? Sure. Yeah. And this, God, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've said this. Is that a homogeneous, one size fits all customer segment? It is not, but is the, it's the largest discrete customer segment that we're thinking of appealing to. As far as sub-segment goes, um, there's a lot of people who have like specific disabilities that make it hard for them to get insurance approval for more expensive devices, but who would still benefit from these devices. And that's a, a smaller specific market we're thinking of targeting. So here's, here's I, I like the broader one, on this, the more focus, and it, there's in all innovation, <laughs> there's that that first phase of going broad, right? To get all the ideas on the table. The stage you're at right now, go a little broad to get all the ideas on the table. Then there's that focus, right? So in this case, I would suggest extremely strongly to break that out in other more focused. So I'll give you an example, right? Youth versus elderly, right? And I say that because there's different usage patterns, I would imagine, and different demands and you know, paraplegics versus quadriplegics, right? Um, oh, the manual, that would take that off the off the table, but um, um, try to break that users out. Full-time users versus full-time users? Yeah. That needs to get broken down in a bit more detail. Okay. okay. But so just real quick, because I know we have another one who wants to jump in. Um, talk Because you started down this path. You talked about manual wheelchair users as part of a bigger play. What's the bigger play? No, they are the bigger plane. And we are saying that the smaller plane is the people who need it for the improved quality of life. So people who's, who would benefit most from it. Now is yours, is your device manual? No, it's joystick operated. And a joystick has to be operated manually or can be other ways, mouth and other ways? Uh, no, but so far it's only with the hand. We, we, have, we have been thinking about accessibility options in that. Um, like right now it's kind of limited to different styles of joystick because not everyone can grip a joystick firmly who might need a device like this. Because part of that, right? You could become, as opposed to the end product, you could become a subsystem, right? That then gets integrated in to another system that then gets delivered to the, uh, to the user. Um, so that is kind of what we're doing, isn't it? Because we're not looking at giving people wheelchairs. We're giving them the power assist which attaches to their wheelchair. No, you're right. Well, you mentioned um, you mentioned quadriplegics and like some of the uh, target markets we've been looking at are people who aren't necessarily, you know, they're not necessarily like paralyzed, but you know, they, they lose muscle strength in their limbs over time. So one thing we could look into is, 
you know, okay, maybe you were using this and five years ago when you got it, you could use the joystick and now you can't, but maybe you can't afford a powered chair. So we can look into, you know, interface upgrades and options for people like that. Very good. Well, listen, I, great job. The, the more you can refine and map, because I, I would think that your value prop as well, that you're going to have multiple value props that are a bit more refined as you start breaking out those segments. And that's okay. Matter of fact, that's encouraged. I think we had another hand raised to jump in. Thank you guys. Yes, MD Sadman, I believe it was. Uh, so my name is MD Sadman and I'm studying at uh, the Francis College of Engineering, uh, Electrical Engineering and, and my junior year. So basically I, uh, let me come from the problem and I just like to shorten things up. Uh, so basically the uh, idea was to come up with a private research and development farms and outsource research and development projects to small and medium scale businesses in the United States and even in third world countries where uh, it is the market is saturated with Chinese technologies and research products. So uh, our aim is uh, the problem was uh, since small and medium scale businesses find it very difficult to afford expensive research and development uh, and it's very uh, cost uh, intensive and it's very uh, human labor, uh, I mean, uh, intellectual intensive. So it's very difficult to accommodate uh, within a short time uh, and compete with big companies like Apple, Amazon, and those who have actually investment for research and development. So uh, so my the problem with my idea is that the, our key, uh, so the idea was, uh, is to come up with the, suppose we take a project from a company, a small uh, company uh, in the United States and uh, form a group of 20 people where there will be uh, market researchers, where there will be professors, there will be engineers, there will be uh, innovators. Uh, uh, like uh, So there will be a group of 20 people allocated for each project. And uh, our revenue stream is a different business model. We would not like to charge any money uh, at the beginning of uh, the project. Uh, we, will, we will be taking around six to nine months for each and every project. And uh, so we would like to... So, uh, so I... Yeah. I, I totally get it. Let me ask this, because I would suggest that that's out there already in, in various forms, and I can connect you with some, some stuff. What do you believe is your core value prop, your secret sauce that's gonna okay. allow you to make those connections better, yeah. faster, cheaper, and Make that a compelling experience for uh, those companies. Okay, three things. First of all, is that we are we will be working on products that ca that cater to solve uh, sustain sustainable development goals, and uh, it's uh, we would like to uh, do in interdisciplinary engineering solutions. Uh, like, uh, for example, let me give an example. Like, uh, suppose structures that are mechanized that are automated. Uh, or structures uh, like uh, bridges that can communicate within themselves. There will be a, uh, like I'm talking about the or I'm talking about the next level of tractors that can plow uh, hundreds of acres of land. So Seven. this is Seven. innovation. Okay. So I think what you're suggesting is your differentiation. Differentiation is not going to be the underlying secret sauce of how to make those connections and facilitate the relationship. That your differentiation it's going to be the segments that you focus on, right? Okay. No, okay. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm asking, is that, a, yeah. is that what you're thinking? Uh, no, I, what probably it's my mistake, but I'm not clear with the value proposition thing. But uh, what I thought about is uh, two other things is that I'm going to patent each and every innovation on the, on our client's name. And it won't be, uh, we would not, uh, produce or provide the same innovation to another uh, our client's competitor or something like that to bring uniqueness in the market. Uh, so that is one thing. Another thing is our business model is kind of uh, like Uber. It will charge uh, on a commission based 
uh, on the quantity produced. Suppose if they produce 1 million quantities uh, and we charge $1 each, we, we get a revenue of $1, but that will be charged not before uh, that's a, I don't know whether it's a differentiation or it's a value proposition, but that will be charged not before we take, uh, take the order, uh, just after we deliver our uh, research project to them. So, okay, so, and this I think Kali is a good, because we're almost done, right? This is a good wrap up point. And I think it ties in to what you're talking about. Um, we focus a lot of times and I think Holly and, and Hunter and others will back me up on this, on technology innovation and, and try to drive that. You're thinking about, I think, a business model innovation. So the, it, the underlying technology doesn't matter at all. You're looking to innovate the, the the business model on how to do effectively marriage brokering between folks who are looking for a problem to be solved and the folks who can solve it. And you're the broker in between who's going to take a piece of the pie. And that piece of the pie is different depending upon the engagement. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, kind of. But uh, I, we have also have a future projected plan. We, if we are, if we specialize in making uh, R and D a great resource for small and medium scale businesses, we might, uh, we might dis like what Apple does is they just design and they just give their intellectual ideas. They manufacture everything outside their countries. So we might start designing and implementing. That's our main goal. Uh, we might. We just sell intellectual ideas, and then uh, we're just gonna manufacture them in uh, third world countries or something like that. So, so that we have. So, so, how much, how much research have you done on who's already in that space? Because there, are, there are a lot of people in that broader space. Now, there may be an opportunity, and we should talk more. But on the high end, look at Flextronics. On the intermediate to lower end, look at incentive. Yes, I have researched about incentive and yeah, but it's uh, what I have figured out, but it depends on the information I got, uh, the outlook from the uh, website or from the internet. It's like uh, they are a kind of built company, but uh, right. something right. is lacking so over there. Okay. So well, let's leave it at that. Next okay. time you and I talk, I want you to convince me why you are better in Innocentive. If you can do that, I love it. Okay, Professor, is it okay if I just mail you and um, set up a Zoom meeting with you next time by next, by next Absolutely. week? Absolutely. Thank you. And quite frankly, there's an opportunity here. and. What you're suggesting is, is pretty compelling, okay? Our job as your mentors and advisors, it's, <laughs> it's a balance between being enthusiastic and encouraging you, but also kind of guiding you that, you know, and Kevin, I see you shaking your head, that this might not be the best path. All right, yes, set something up. We'll find some time. And if, if we come across as kind of negative, that's absolutely not the intent. And quite frankly, um, it's a good skill on your end to deal with folks who you envision as negative because as an entrepreneur, <laughs> you're gonna experience that, but that's not our intent. Holly, the floor is back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for facilitating that. An awesome job to all of the students who are having great discussions in the breakout rooms and also um, those who volunteered to present.
So I just wanted to leave you with some next steps. So our last workshop is next week on March 2nd, same time. The registration link is here, uml.edu slash 2021 DM workshop four. And that's the rocket pitch coaching workshop. So basically at this workshop, we're going to teach you and showcase sort of what the judges are looking for and really help you begin to develop and put everything into a nice PowerPoint. So I urge you to all attend that, um, the last workshop next week. And then next week on the 5th is actually when your idea plan is due online. So this workshop series, if you attended or, or couldn't attend, but watched the videos and started working on those worksheets, putting all of that together will help you answer and develop all of the questions online, which then makes your idea plan. So log in online, check out those questions. You can begin answering them now if you wish to do so. You can save it and come back to it later, but just make sure that you hit the submit button by 5 p.m. on March 5th. And then from there, your idea plans are going to be read and scored by judges who we call readers. And then the top 30 to 35 teams will move forward to pitch on April 7th. So more details to come with all of that, but please do attend the last workshop next week and then make sure you get your idea plan in on time. So are there any questions before we end the event? Oh, I just wanted to, to throw it out. Um, and I think you've mentioned this to all the teams. All of us, mentors, instructors, advisors, guys, one of the most important skills. And so I was very encouraged when you said, can, can I reach out to you later? Ask, reach out, engage. We're here to help. And it's your job to be aggressive at that. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for being here this evening, especially Tom and Kalila, Hunter and Carter, who really took the lead on this workshop. And then our other awesome faculty fellows, Kevin, Kathy, Tom, Ray, and um, for being here this evening. And then also our co-op students, um, Adam was here, Lena and Yeeharn, and it looks like they are still here. And then of course, I wanna thank Adam Dunbar, who's the operations person um, helping with Zoom. So, and then of course, thank you to all the students for coming here this evening. Um, if there are any last questions, I'll hang back for a few minutes. But other than that, I wish you all a great night and I hope to see you next week at workshop four.